Welcome to the UChem tutorial on naming by example. This video is about ionic compounds. So we are going to be naming ionic compounds here. We're going to go from formula to name and then also from name to formula. Let's first talk about ionic compounds. These are compounds composed of a cation and an anion. Cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged. The cations are either metal ions or the ammonium ion, a polyatomic ion with a plus charge. The anions are negatively charged ions, and these are non-metal ions or polyatomic anions. The polyatomic anions are anions that are composed of multiple atoms, hence the name polyatomic, and these are anions that are commonly found in compounds and should be memorized, so you should memorize the name, the formula, and the charge on the common polyatomic anions. Your chemistry textbook will have those, and in your chemistry course, your instructor should let you know what polyatomic ions are important for that course. So let's take a look at metals with invariant charge versus metals that have varying charge. These will give us two categories of naming or two ways to name ionic compounds. So underneath the umbrella of ionic compounds, there are two sets of rules. One for those that have metals with invarying charge. Those will be the group one, group two, and then magnesium, zinc, silver, and aluminum. All of those have invariant charges. Group one are those alkaline metals, they have a plus one charge. Group two are those alkaline earth metals, those have a plus two charge. Now you also have many of these metals with varying charge. These are metals in the transition metal and post-transition metals. Those that are past group one and two can have multiple charges. So the Example of this that I'm going to give is iron. Iron can have a plus two or a plus three charge. So you will have to know some of the common metals that have multiple charges and the charges that they can have. Or I'll teach you how to infer or deduce the charge of a metal all right, from its place in a compound. All right, so let's get started by giving you some examples so we can learn from the examples to give you an idea of how to do some naming. So we're going to go first from formula to name. So I will probably not do this very often, but before we learn how to say the name, I will just say that we have KBr here and CaCO3 here, but that's not how chemists usually speak. So we have to actually build a name from these formulas. So the name of the first compound is potassium bromide. And how I figured that out was that I looked at that compound and I could see that it's composed of a cation and an anion. This is an ionic compound. The cation is potassium and K represents potassium on the periodic table. And then bromide, all right, is the name for the anion formed from the element bromine. So I take the base name Br for bromine, and then I add an ide, and the ide indicates that this is the anion. So we have a full name of potassium bromide. Now it's important to look in that compound that the positive and the negative charges balance each other out. So we do have one plus charge and one minus charge, so this is a neutral unit here. All right, let's take a look at the next compound over there on the right. That is calcium carbonate. And I'm gonna start with calcium, the cation. That is an alkali metal. I know that its charge is plus two and it is invariant. And so this is going to be matched with carbonate, that CO3 two minus. And I don't have to change the ending on carbonate because carbonate is the name of the anion, CO3 two minus. So bromine, is the name of an element that's uncharged, and I have to change the ending to indicate that it is a bromide ion. Carbonate is the name of an ion already, so I don't need to change the ending on that. Okay. Now, one note here is that in ionic compounds, we're always looking at formula units, which is the simplest ratio of the anion and cation in the compound that forms something that's neutral in charge. So we can see for both potassium bromide and calcium carbonate that we have balances of positive and negative charges to make the sum of those from the anion and the cation zero. That's gonna come into play when we get to some more complicated compounds. So let's 
get to some compounds that contain metals with multiple charges. So we're going to begin with a compound that contains iron, and then I will name one that contains copper. So let's start by just breaking apart my compound into two pieces. The first piece is the cation, the next piece is the anion. So I have iron and sulfate in this compound. Now between the two I put these parentheses and the parentheses are there always when we have a cation that can have multiple charges. So if it's anything that you know has multiple charges you gotta put those parentheses there. We'll fill the parentheses with a Roman numeral and the Roman numeral will represent the charge on the metal. So now we have to figure that out. So Fe2 represents two iron ions in that compound, and the SO4 is sulfate, that's an anion. It has a minus two charge, and there are three of them. So if I have three times minus two, I have a total of negative six as my anion charge. So I need plus six to balance that. So if my iron has a plus three charge, and there are two of them, then I have plus six as the overall charge on iron. So plus six minus six, I'm balanced, so all I have to do is transfer the three into the Roman numerals and then put that into my parentheses, and so I have the charge on the metal being the Roman numeral in parentheses. Now let's take a look at the other compound over there on the right. This is copper parentheses chloride, and I have to fill in the charge there. So to do that, I take a look at the copper and chloride ions here. The chloride ion is a halogen, that means it has a negative one charge, and I have two of them, so total I have a minus two charge, and copper there has to balance that, so it's gonna have a plus two charge. I just put the plus two as a Roman numeral inside of those parentheses. All right, so now we've talked about the two types of ionic compounds. Those types of ionic compounds that contain metals without the change in charge, and then I have those that can vary in charge like iron and copper. Now, what we're going to do is go ahead and go in the opposite direction. What I want to go do is go from name to formula because you need to do that as well. And that gets a little bit trickier with these... Um, compounds that contain multiple ions with multiple charges. So let's take a look at one of those first. What I have is cobalt one sulfate. What that means is that I have cobalt with a plus one charge and sulfate that has a negative two charge. If I looked at that formula, I would find that I don't have a balance in charges, so I have to figure out how to balance the charges. So for the minus two charge, I have to balance with a plus two charge. That means I have two of those cobalts there. Now, when you do this, um, it's often really nice to do a little trick where what you do is you do this little crossing idea. So once you know the charges on something, you can take and what you do is cross the, the numbers. So I'm going to put a 1 here and I'll cross this over and I got a 2 there. We usually don't write the 1 because it's kind of redundant to put a little one there if there's only one of those in the compound. So when I write cobalt one sulfate, I'm gonna have CO2SO4, and none of those complicated um, charges and everything that I've written there within the compound. Okay. So magnesium nitrate is my next example. Magnesium is one of those that does not have multiple charges, so I know that it has a plus two charge. The nitrate has to balance it, and I know that has a minus one charge. So what I need are two nitrates to balance the one magnesium. And again, just take away those charges because they are not found within the compound. What you need to do is just, when you write the, the formula name, you need to just erase those charges above the formula because we don't write them when we write the formula. Okay. All right, so what we've done here is we've gone from name to formula. You can also go from formula to name with both types of ionic compounds.